found the body, five years old. The mother was right behind her, but the name's Krilling. This is Krilling, Detective Constable Peters and uh, Detective Sergeant Wexford, Kings Markham CID. Any chance of a signature on these before you go? No, oh. none at all. I've been trying to get my lunch for half an hour. Oh, go on, put it on my desk. I'll see to them straight after. Ah, oh, great. Just the man. I'd like you to have a look at that. It's from an old friend of mine. I haven't seen him in years, but we'll keep in touch. I'd just like you to give him all the help you can. Hmm? It'll be a little trip down memory lane for you. Well, can't stop. I've got a lunch appointment. good friend of our deputy chief constable so somehow or other he's got influence in the old pals network i just like the clergy in general and the vicars i've come across in particular have never been vicarious enough for me they always want you to worship the god in them oh dumplings I had to order for you they were closing up yeah. you know me too well paint a case that this vicar wants to talk to you about i'm sure i know the name well you've got a very good memory if you do Happened 30 years ago. Painter was an odd job man. He took an axe to his employer. A defenseless old woman of 90, battered her to death, and then stole 200 pounds. It happened in one of those big houses up the Stoughton Road. An ugly, sinister place. Well, that's it. I do know him. We used to cycle out there as kids and dare each other to go into the grounds. 
So what on earth does a vicar want with a 30-year-old murder case? Oh, amateur crime writer, I imagine. Or his stipend isn't keeping up with inflation. You know, it's surprising how many of these clergy like to dabble on the dark side. Well, the case itself, I mean, it's a big local sensation, but I don't remember it being remarkable in any other way. Well, it was remarkable for me. It was the first murder case I'd handled on my own. And it was remarkable for Herbert Arthur Painter. He was hanged for it. Now, calm yourself down. Calm down, man. We'll sort this all out. Constable? Alice Flower Sarge, your old lady's maid. She's got back from church. Now, let me know when she calms down. The beast did this to her. Now, the ma beast. Ma. That's the shopping block. It had blood all over it. Right. Mark it and keep looking. You seem certain about who did it, Sarge. The beast, whoever he is. Mrs. Painter? Yes? Is uh, your husband in? No, he went out. Oh, well, can we come in? Well, do you have to? I've got a young child asleep. Well, we're investigating the murder of uh, your husband's employer, Mrs. Primero. You're looking out for somebody, Mrs. Painter? No, I just don't like the thought of the neighbours knowing the police are crawling all over me house. <laughs> That's a very pretty little girl. Had a fall recently, Mrs. Painter? No way. Very nasty bruise. Sarge, down here, bloodstains. Tell me where these blood stains come from, Mrs. Painter. What's all this then? Mr. Painter? Yes. Detective Sergeant Wexford. So? We're investigating the murder of Mrs. Primero. Can you tell me what you were doing between the hours of six and seven this evening, sir? Why are you asking me? Sarge! Found this under the mattress. Must be 200 pounds now. Sir, excuse me, sir. Yes, yes, yes. I'll get to it straight away. Now, look, I'm expecting an emissary from God. Show him in here when he gets here, will you? I'm sorry if I'm a little early, Chief Inspector. Oh, <laughs> no, not at all, Mr. Archery. I thought the Reverend would be better off in here, sir. Yes, thank you, Sergeant. Well, do take a seat. Thank you. I must say, uh, you're not quite what I expected. I've decided to dispense with the dog collar for a few days. I see. So, uh, what is your interest in the painter case, Mr. Archery? Chief Inspector, I want you to tell me that somewhere in your mind there is doubt, the faintest doubt, of painter's guilt. Can't be done. Painter did it. He's guilty beyond a shadow of doubt. And you can quote me on that in your book. Book? I'm not writing a book, Chief Inspector. Of course, I don't know any more about this sort of thing than the average layman, but I did manage to obtain a copy of the transcript of the trial, and it does seem to me that there are a good many gaps in the evidence. Why are you interested in defending a man who was hanged 30 years ago, Mr. Archery? My reasons are very personal, Chief Inspector, and I can assure you there's no possibility of my publishing anything you feel you can tell me. No mysteries in this case. No cunning little red herrings. Herbert Painter killed his 90-year-old employer with an axe for 200 pounds. He was a brutal, savage moron. And if I may say so, he's a strange character for a parson to champion. 
Thirty years is a long time, Chief Inspector. Perhaps after you've refreshed your memory, we could discuss the matter in more detail. Herbert Arthur Painter, you stand charged in this indictment with capital murder. The particulars being that you, on the 27th day of March, 1959, murdered Rose Primero. How say you? Are you guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. I, I didn't do it, sir. Can we go now? This must be the room. Country walk, you said. Spontaneity, curiosity. All the devious manipulation of a workaholic. Hmm? Come on, have a look. Oh, that poor little girl. I mean, five years old, finding a body like that. Let's have a look round the back. interested 30 years later anti hanging lobby is my guess god knows what he hopes to get out of the painter case well he certainly won't get any help from you will he no he won't jenny the man hacked an old woman to death for the sake of 200 pounds to me that justifies the death penalty Mike, there are just some issues you and I are not going to agree on. Actually, you're in good company. Reg doesn't agree with me either. Oh. Oh, come on, Mike. I don't like this place. It's just a house? Hmm. Ah! Ah! Mike! Mike! I didn't expect Chief Inspector Wexford to welcome me with open arms. Yes. Well, hopefully I can persuade him otherwise. Yes. I was thinking exactly the same thing myself at breakfast. It must be 20 years since we spent the night apart. Well, no, I slept like a log, actually. Where would you like to start, Mr. Archery? Uh, Painter admitted that he was on bad... bad terms with his employer, Mrs. Pomero, because she refused to give him a rise. He testified that on the day before the murder, she sent him up to her bedroom to get the 200 pounds. It was a sort of one-off payment instead of a rise. I didn't believe it. Mrs. Pomero wasn't the sort of a woman that would allow her gardener to go rummaging about in her bedroom. If she hadn't got the money on her, she would have got a maid to get it for her. Well, reading between the lines, Mrs. Pomero was a rather mean old woman. Perhaps she didn't want her maid to know her gardener was being given a bonus. There's no way that he could have got upstairs without the maid hearing him. Why not? Because he would have had to clump right past the kitchen where she was working. Then there's the question of the blood. The painter's defence was that he was covered in blood because he'd cut himself chopping wood. Now, he was the same blood type as Mrs. Pomero, so that doesn't link him with the crime. Well, uh, methods were not quite as advanced as they are now. But the link for me was the amount of blood. There was just too much blood to come from... 
a cut on the hand. And also there was his raincoat, which was stained with blood and hidden under some bushes. A raincoat that he kept in the old woman's house. A coat that could have been worn by anyone and then later hid. Mr. Archer. Which leads on to his repeated assertion that he saw a tramp in the grounds earlier that day. Well, he was clutching at straws, wasn't he? If Painter went up to the wardrobe and stole the money after murdering Mrs. Primero, why wasn't there any blood on the inside of the wardrobe? Well, he wore gloves. We reckon that he stunned the old lady with the side of the axe, went upstairs, got the money, and when he came back, he finished her off in panic. Doesn't that strike you as rather odd? I mean, surely he must have realised he'd have been a suspect. He wouldn't have been that transparent. Oh, he's stupid. Some of them are. Plain stupid. Was he? Or is that your assumption of a man you really knew nothing about? Painter had a daughter. Yes, I remember. She was a little girl about five at the time. Tess. My only son, Charles, wants to marry her. He's at Oxford, taking his master's in modern grades. And you're worried about him marrying beneath him? On the contrary, Chief Inspector. The daughter of that stupid man, Painter, is my son's tutor. She's a fellow of Balliol. Are you sure she's Herbert Painter's daughter? Absolutely positive. She's a beautiful, intelligent, charming woman. When she told me about her background, she broke down and cried. A woman of her strength and maturity. You see... She knows her father was innocent. I married Irene a couple of years after it all happened, but I brought Tess up as if she were my own. And she's climbed higher than even I expected. You've done a wonderful job. You really have. Mr. Archery, I know you haven't come down here for a cosy in-laws get-together, but I can't tell you anything that isn't public knowledge. Well, Tess told me that her mother knew something. Something that would prove Painter was innocent. So I believe. I've never asked her. Well, why not? The problems you have about stigma and hereditary traits are all a nonsense to me. I believe in taking life as it comes. You see, I don't care whether Painter were guilty or not. But I do. And so does your stepdaughter. I happen to know she's in a great deal of pain, but doesn't know how to tackle her mother about it. You see, there's a shadow hanging over my son's marriage, and it just shouldn't be there. That was Tess just after she was made a fellow of Balliol. Now, which cake would you like, Mr. Archery? This is most kind of you, Mrs. Kershaw. I'd really like to talk to you we'll about... We'll start you off with a Dundee and see how you go from there, shall we? Do sit down. Thank you. Mrs. Kershaw, this is so difficult. And the last thing I want to do is to cause you any distress. But Tess told me that you knew something that could clear her father's name. I know it's something you've never felt able to tell her. And, of course, it's highly presumptuous of me to ask. But I really need to know... Sugar? No, thank you. I never talk of it, Mr. Archery. I prefer to let the past be the past. This is so painful. I promise you, if we can discuss it once, I'll never bring the subject up again. I've been over to King's Markham. Oh, I suppose it's been... Built up and spoilt since I was there. Such a long time ago. Please. Tell me about Tess's father. He was no murderer. You'll have to take my word for it. He was a good, kind man who'd never have harmed a fly. But how do you know? How can you know? Did you hear something? See something? Now, look what I've done. I'm very keen on a white wedding. Get your wife to back me up, would you? Mr. Archery, what's past is past. Elizabeth! Elizabeth! Elizabeth Krilling! 
You were told not to play with the painter girl. What would happen if you disobeyed me? What would happen? Tell me. Tell me. Please. Sorry, miss. We're closing now. No, you're not. We are to you. Tell me some parish gossip. Well, something must have happened. Well, tell Charles he'll have to wait. Look, I'm doing everything I can. evidence that had been overlooked, an alibi that only his wife could prove. Nevertheless, I would still like to talk to the other people involved. Alice the maid, the woman whose daughter found the body, and Mrs. Primero's grandchildren. I believe they all inherited a substantial amount of money. Of course, I can't stop you. But I don't have to tell you that to be very careful before you make a lot of unfounded accusations. Chief Inspector, I don't want to find someone else guilty. I simply want to prove Painter innocent. I'm afraid you'll find the former consequent upon the latter. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. There's been a very serious accident on the high street. Well, my God, what's that got to do with me? It's not you. They want, sir. It... Almighty God, with whom do live the spirits of just men, made perfect, after they are delivered from this their earthly prison, we humbly commend the soul of this thy servant, our dear brother into thy hands, as into the hands of a faithful creator and most merciful saviour, humbly beseeching thee that it may be precious in thy sight.
I'm sorry, sir, but he was calling for a priest. Wrong denomination, I know, but I knew that you were nearby. Thank you. I've seen death before, of course, but in the young, it's always more tragic. Yes, it's a harsh thing to witness. I still remember my first time. Soon after I came back here, young man about the same age as this one. Not so quiet. He was screaming about a girl and a child. He wanted a clergyman too. Well, I hope he got one. No, no, he didn't. He died unshriven, I think the word is. Never forget his name. Grace. John Grace. God moves in a mysterious way. He's wonders to perform. Yes, yes, he does. All right, take it to the station. Oh, you said you wanted to question Mrs. Krilling, whose daughter found the body? Yeah, that's possible, yes. Well, ask the daughter in the back of the car there. I'm about to charge her with manslaughter. Elizabeth Krilling, where is she? What have you done with her, my baby? My daughter! Oh. Where is my baby? Shh, yourself. For God's sake. Didn't she try to kiss you once when you were taking her to the funny farm at Stowerton? Yeah, she insisted we were going on our honeymoon. <laughs> Actually, it's something I'd rather forget. Mrs. Krilling, what was your relationship with the murdered woman, Mrs. Primero? We were very good friends. Very good friends indeed. We only lived across the way. She looked on my daughter as one of her own. We used to call her Granny Rose. Would you tell the court what happened on that Sunday night? Yes. I had been making my daughter a party frock. We were going to show it off to Granny Rose. Her maid was at church and I just popped over to see if it was a good time to call. I looked in through the window and I saw that she was asleep. At what time was this? At about 25 past six. When you looked in, did you notice anything? Yes. I noticed that the coal scuttle was empty, which meant that Painter had, hadn't been in to fill it up. Then I went back at about seven with my daughter. The uh, back door was unlocked. Elizabeth ran ahead and she found the body. Thank you, Mrs. Krilling. No questions, my lord. With the evidence against you and the seriousness of the offence, I have no alternative but to commit you for trial at the Crown Court. What are you going to do to her? You can't send her to prison. She can't go to prison. Move that woman, please. No, I won't let her be shut away. I won't let her be shut away. You've got a kind face. Help me, please. You could always apply for bail. Bail! Bail! I demand bail. This is a very dear old friend of mine. He says I can have bail. I want my rights for my baby. I won't let you shut her away, you stupid old cow. Do I understand you wish to ask for bail? Very well. Thank you. To my dear friend from Mrs. Quilling. Take my advice to tear it up. She's a nutter. She wants me to visit her at home. She wants to thank me personally. Get that a miss if I leave, sir.
do you want? I saw your mother in court this morning. She asked me to come and see her. <laughs> that was this morning. Well, go on in then. But I'd taken a rolled up newspaper if I was you. Mrs. Krilling. Mrs. Krilling. Mrs. Krilling. Mrs. Krilling. You hadn't forgotten I was coming. Who are you? We met this morning in court. You sent me a note. Oh! My tablet! Get me my tablet! No, no! On the mantelpiece! And then you can... Get out! Look, I'm sorry. If I've done anything to distress you... I... Where's my baby? She went out. We, we met as I came in. Water! Water! I can't take them without water! I know who you are. You want to take my baby away. I saw you with them. I saw you coming out of the court with them. No, Mrs. Krilling, you're confused. I'm the one who helped you. I can't let them get her in there, in prison. They'll find it out in there. Find out what? They'll find it all out. But I'll kill her first. Do you hear me? I'll kill her first. You're right, sir. Oh, hello. Inspector Burden, isn't it? Yes, that's right. I've just come from Mrs. Krilling's. She is a very strange woman. She didn't know me at first. Then she seemed to be in great pain. Then she forgot about it. Then there was this incredible outburst. I should have taken your advice. It's mostly in the mind with her, sir. Next time you see her, she'll probably be as nice as pie. She's up one minute and down the next. She. Fancy a cup of tea? Thank you. As far as I know, um, the father died young. Up till then, the Krillings were a perfectly respectable middle-class family. Then there was the murder. And the daughter grew up difficult. She was in and out of schools. To juvenile court when she was about 14. And she's been on the edge of trouble ever since, really. I wonder how much finding the old woman's body might have affected her. It's hard to say. Certainly would have helped if the mother had been more stable. She's been in and out of mental hospitals more than a few times. And the daughter had to be taken into care when that happened. I don't suppose I should be telling you this, but... Um, Mrs. Krilling was very concerned that if her daughter, her baby, as she kept calling her was sent to prison. I suppose it would be prison. Yes, it might well be. She was very concerned that she might blurt out some terrible secret. I wonder if it's got anything to do with the Primero murder. So much revolves around that raincoat and who wore it. I don't see why Mrs. Krilling couldn't have worn it and then hidden it afterwards. You say she's always been unbalanced. She had just as much opportunity as painter. What would her motive have been? Mad people's motives are often very difficult for the sane to understand. Yeah, but she dotes on her daughter in her own funny way. She wouldn't have taken the child with her. At the trial, Mrs. Quilling said she first went to the house at 6.25. But we've only her word for it. Supposing she went to the house at 20 to 7, after Painter had left, there would have been time for her to commit the murder. Then she would have taken the child there afterwards. Because no one would ever believe that a mother would take her own daughter to find a body she knew was already there. It's a terrible thought, isn't it? 
You've missed your vocation, sir. You should have joined the force. You'd be a superintendent by now. dance night. <laughs> they have them once a month. We always come. It's me. I love to dance. Would you like to dance now? feeling I've seen you somewhere before. No, I don't think so. I would remember. Unless you... You don't read women's magazines. No. <laughs> I read the Times. Well, I was in the Times once. Really? Mm. There was a high court case and someone mentioned my name. And the judge said, Who is Imogen Eyed? <laughs> and who is Imogen Eyed? I was a model, quite successful. The most photographed face in Britain of that year. Is the Reverend Henry Archery? Oh, at all the way you described him to me. You didn't tell me he was good looking. Why oh, didn't look up to me? Come on, have a coffee. Here's my husband back. Would you like to join us for the evening? If you've nothing better to do. Uh, no, no, thank you. Can I get you a drink? Thank you. I, I must make a phone call. If you'll excuse me. Good night.
The beast? Not a very flattering angle. His widow described him to archery as a kind, gentle man who wouldn't harm a fly. Hmm. Where did all these come from? Chronicle Archives. Mike, do you think Miss Vickers onto something? No, I don't. Then why the fascination? I don't know. Um, curiosity, really. History of the case, history of the man I work with. Hmm. Does Resh know you've got these? No, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite interesting, really. Before the trial, the Krillings were a respectable middle-class family, and you'd have expected their daughter, Elizabeth, to have made something of her life. Whereas the painters were poor, working class, and the daughter had to grow up with the stigma of having a murderer as a father. Mm. Yet she's the one who's achieved everything. It's called social mobility. There's so little of it in this country. It sticks out a mile. Oh, that's what it's called, is it? Would you have been so curious if Painter had just been sent to prison instead of being hanged? No, I don't suppose I would be. Oh. But then he would have been released years ago, free to hack down a string of old ladies. For heaven's sake. <laughs> I'm sorry to surprise you like this. Oh, come in, come in. Mum told me where you were staying. Charles doesn't know I'm here. I just didn't want you to hear over the phone. I've called the wedding off. When I get married, I want it to be a celebration. I don't see how that can happen if my background is on trial. Look, Tess, I'm sorry. It's all right. I grew up an outcast because of what my father is supposed to have done. I understand your reasons. Your love for Charles, even the kindness in trying to clear my name. Look. I haven't come up with anything concrete as yet. I just don't think it's as open and shut as they say. My mother has told me that despite what everyone thinks and says, that my father was a gentle, kind, loving man. Now, that's good enough for me. I have to believe it. I understand if it's not good enough for you. Have you spoken to Charles about this? I've talked to Charles about the wedding. He won't accept it. But then, that's Charles. On. Sorry, madam? It's a condition of madam's bail. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Krilling, isn't it? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, miss. See you again tomorrow.
Look, um, I suppose there isn't anything in it. In what? That Liz Crilly has some deep secret that her mother doesn't want let out under third degree? There's just something about them. They make me feel uneasy. They're no different to our other customers. You look closely enough, everybody's got something that they want to hide. But perhaps this has got something to do with a painter case. Now that's enough, Mike! I'm not going to hide any more of this. What are you trying to imply? That I made a mistake 30 years ago? No, of course not. You know I didn't mean that. I don't know. I don't know anything. All I know is that the painter case was an open and shut affair. And nobody's got a hope in hell of showing he didn't do it. Why don't you get your friend Archery to prize it out of the daughter? He's a fast worker, that one. Is he? What makes you say that? Never mind. Well, I've got work to do, even if you haven't. Oh, she can't move her hands, but her hearing's perfectly good. She can talk the hind leg off a donkey. Oh, yeah, she likes a good gossip. You like a good gossip, don't you, Alice? Visitor for you, the Reverend Archery. Hello, Alice. Would it upset you to talk to me about Mrs. Primero? Of course it wouldn't. She loves it. This is rather a private matter, if you wouldn't mind. Private? It's the whole ward's bedtime story. Nothing cheers them up like a good murder. Nevertheless, if you wouldn't mind. What exactly did you want to know, sir? I, I realize it's a long time ago, but anything you feel you can tell me about Mrs. Primero, her grandchildren, Mrs. Krilling, and, of course, Painter. I was scared of him, but I never let him know it. It was me that nicknamed him the Beast. Chief Inspector. I'm sorry, Mr. Archery. You'll have to wait. I'm on a call. I won't detain you. I wanted to let you know I've just had a very interesting conversation with the maid, Alice Flower. Mr. Archery, I don't know how to put this politely, so I shan't bother. But I'm fed up to the back teeth with your ridiculous inquiries. I'm sorry about that, but you'll have to listen to me now. Alice Flower has given me information that may well prove Herbert Painter was innocent. Mr. Painter, do you recognize this axe? Yes. Please, tell the court where you have seen it before. In the place where I used to work. I, I used it for chopping up wood. Yes, did you also use it to attack Mrs. Primero on that Sunday evening? No. But let us go back to the day before the murder. Now, you admitted to the court that you had an argument with Mrs. Primero about your wages. You threatened to leave unless she gave you a rise. You then told the court that she instructed you to get 200 pounds from her bedroom, but not to tell the maid, because she would want a raise as well. That's right. That's exactly what happened. Would you tell the court what you were wearing on your feet at the time? Carpet slippers, perhaps? No. Shoes. In fact, your shoes were rather large, heavy workman's boots, were they not? Yes. And to get to Mrs. Primero's bedroom, you would have had to walk past the kitchen, go up the stairs next to the kitchen, and then walk along a bare wooden corridor directly above the kitchen. Yes. But the maid, Alice Flower, who was in the kitchen at the time, and whom we have established as having had excellent hearing, didn't hear your great workman's boots clumping along up and over her. Well, she should have heard me. Because that's exactly what happened. All she heard, Mr. Painter, was you and Mrs. Primero arguing. Your story is a tissue of lies, isn't it? it no! Don't... It damn well isn't! No, sir. It isn't.
No, darling, I don't think it's a good idea for Charles to come over. Because I'm getting on very well on my own, the last thing I need right now is for Charles to come steaming in at full speed. I've spoken to the police. We'll just have to be patient. There's nothing more we can do. I know. I Look, if I can prove Tess's father was innocent, the wedding will be on again. Look, I really feel I'm getting somewhere. The maid's story is the first real breakthrough. Alice Flower. Well, tell Charles he'll just have to be patient. Do you think he's uncovered something? I doubt it. Since I've said I'll uh, give him every assistance, I'll go and see the maid. You don't have any nagging doubts about it, do you? About painter being hanged? No, you know my views about that. And as for his guilt, I've got no doubt whatever. This damned turbulent priest stirring up the past makes you relive it whether you want to or not. London number, please. The Ministry of Defence. down to Forby Cemetery. My husband's family has a vault down there. Very few. There's a lovely church there. Have you seen much of the countryside around here yet? Very little, I'm afraid. I'm fascinated by fonts and clerestories. It's my thing. I don't suppose that interests you at all. Quite the contrary, actually. Well, I'll take a ride there this afternoon, if you think it's worth seeing. I'm going right now. Why don't I give you a lift? Well, thank you. I like that. You took the job knowing that one of your duties was cold fetching? Not at all bloody hours of the day and night. That's got to be worth extra. You're paid more than enough. Extra. I've got a wife and child. Who are well taken care of. It's money that feeds them. Oh! <laughs> see why this vicar's making such a fuss about a broken dish and a spoiled bit of lamb. I know, Miss Flower, but we didn't discuss it at the time, and it is such a long time ago. Oh, there's nothing wrong with my memory, sir. I can see it as real as I can tell it. Do you suppose it would have been possible for Painter to go upstairs and into Mrs. Primero's bedroom while you were dealing with the mess, without you hearing him? Adam would never have let him go near her bedroom, sir. An animal like that. Anyway, she told me everything. She'd never give money to him or not to me. Never. But calm yourself. Why all the first, sir? I told the vicar. We, we all know he murdered her. Who else would want to harm madam? <laughs> Nurse! Oh. Nurse! He was as guilty as sin. Guilty! <laughs>
I don't remember inviting you in. Do you mind putting something on? Yeah. Where's your mother? I have no idea. Gone out. I'm not her keeper. Am I my mother's keeper? That's good, don't you think? Which reminds me, what's that clergyman doing here? Looking for a job? I phoned my firm yesterday when I got back from that bloody court and they gave me the push. Got you lot to thank for that. What's on offer? What exactly are you here for? Are you lonely, Inspector? Got a light? No, I haven't. Light it for me, will you? They're hers. Chronic back pain. Trapped nerve at the base of her spine. She won't have an operation. She just doses herself up all the time. She gets all sorts of junk. You've no right turning things over. That's searching. And for searching, you need a warrant. You never answered me about the clergyman. He's here because he knows Painter's daughter. Painter that killed the old woman? But that was years ago. I used to go over to the coach house to play with her. My mother never knew. She said Tess wasn't my class. I could never understand that. I thought, how can she have a class if she doesn't go to school? Mother was always with the old woman. Yak, yak, yak. There was nothing to do. No one to play with except Tessie. Why are you looking at me like that? Stirring things up. You've got no right. No right. Get out! Get out! Just call me if there's anything you want to talk to me about. Anything at all.
Way. Oh. You must never go widdishins round a church. It's meant to be unlucky. Would you like to see the leper hole? This is where they used to kneel. What it must have been like. Sentenced to be an outcast. Unclean. To be allowed once a week to watch the rest of the villagers singing in a prayer together. It's appalling, isn't it? Thank you. I'm going to put these on the grave now. So, why don't you have a little walk around? I won't be long. Reflecting on your own mortality? No, a strange coincidence. Someone was telling me the other day about this young man's death. He was killed in a car accident. He was a poet, apparently. Go, shepherd, to your rest. Your tale is told. The Lamb of God takes shepherds to his fold. Didn't notice the time. Oh, no hurry. It's always nice to see a new man at work. <laughs> I've just brought back some dry cleaning. There should be another one in the other room. Thank you. So, was Alice Flower coherent? Very. She has total recall. I believe that's the expression. She uh, began with a lengthy character assassination of Mrs. Krilling. According to Alice, Mrs. Krilling was never a real friend. She just wanted to worm her daughter into the old lady's affection so that she'd be remembered in her will. But the old lady didn't make a will. No. She couldn't stand lawyers. So everything automatically went uh, to her natural heirs, the grandchildren, Roger Premier and his two little sisters. Then she spent an hour telling me what a wonderful grandson Roger was and how he dutifully visited her every Sunday afternoon. And, um, was Archery right about the smashed dish in the kitchen? She smashed a dish and dropped a roasting hot leg of lamb on the floor. So possibly, uh, Painter could have gone upstairs without her hearing. But in view of the solid case against him, I don't see that the jury's verdict would have been swayed by knowing about it. I think you ought to know. I went to see Elizabeth Krilling. Did you know? Yes. Now, it's only a gut feeling, but I really do think that she is hiding something, something important. I would have thought that with your views on hanging, 
You'll be the last person that want to prove me wrong. Reg, I am not trying to prove you wrong. Hello? Yes, sir, he is. Just a moment. Yes? Yes, it is. I see. No, not at all. Thank you for calling. That was a message from the hospital. Alice Flower died early this morning. She became ill when I was interrogating her. She was nearly 90. Could have been brought on by anything. It was a painful experience for her. As I expect it was for Elizabeth Krilling. Bye, Jenny. Bye. Dad, I am here because you don't seem to have got very far. I love Tess and I want to marry her. If you hadn't been against her background, none of it would have happened. Charles, that is neither fair nor accurate. You both wanted Painter's name cleared. Well, of course we did. This thing has plagued her all her life. But the difference between you and me is that in the end, I don't give a damn whether her father ran amok and butchered an entire old people's home. Why do you keep your voice down? I think you've been relying on police cooperation far too much. This character, Wexford, is never willingly going to investigate himself. Charles, you haven't even met the man. All right, all right. Give him the benefit of the doubt. He didn't pervert the course of justice. He simply made an old-fashioned mistake. But you can't honestly expect him to put up his hand now and wave goodbye to career and pension. We've got to start boxing clever. Come on, let's go. Look, Charles, I told you, Alice the Maid talked a great length about how Roger Primero was the model grandson. But a few months before she died, he did ask the old lady for £10,000 so he could set himself up in business. Yes. As that was all the money the old lady had, she refused. The matter was closed. He never asked again. When she died, he was perfectly content with his third share, a sum far short of what he needed. But everything Alice had to say suggests a kind, loving and attentive relative. Exactly. What do you mean, exactly? Well, Roger Primero sounds too good to be true, so he's the one I'm going after. Well, you're going about it in a very dishonest way. What's the matter? This is where it happened. Where the young man was killed. The one I attended. It was about your age. blazer will give me a little more respectability. I'm not convinced. Just try to remember who I am, what I'm supposed to represent. Dad, if you're investigating a murder, you've got to be prepared to be a bit left-handed. Look, Charles... Anyway, it's too late. I've already set up the appointment. He thinks I'm doing a profile on him for the Times. Apparently, he loves blabbing to journalists about the Roger Primero rags to riches story. Oh, no. Who on earth is that? If she comes in, try not to look at her. Why not? Oh, my dear, my dear, my dear friend. What a lovely surprise. I was just saying to my daughter this morning, I do hope I meet that nice man again, so I can thank him for ministering to me. In my hour of affliction. Um, th this is my son, Charles. Charles, this is Mrs. Krilling. Ah, Mrs. Krilling, how do you do? I've heard so much about you. Nice things, I hope. What else could he say? Please, please, join us. Oh, how very kind. Isn't this sweet? Service! You were asked not to come in here again, Mrs. Krilling. I'm sorry, you'll have to leave. Uh, please, as our guest. Well, try and keep her under control. Yes? Pot of tea. My baby is in so much trouble. Who's to help us? 
Well, talking can sometimes help. Why not start at the beginning? Oh, my dear boy. You see, it could have been. It should have been so different for her. Really? Yes, really. I had a dear old friend, you see, who simply doted on my baby. She was rolling money, kept servants, all that kind of thing. And she was always going on about what she'd do for my baby. I passed it over, of course, having an absolute revulsion about stepping into dead men's shoes. <coughs> White sugar, please, can't stand that demerara muck. <coughs> Silly bitch! Oh, dear, where was I? Uh, you were talking about stepping into dead men's shoes. You're not the mercenary type. Exactly! Still, you've got to look after your own. I didn't press it. Until the doctor told me my husband had only six months to live. No pension, no insurance. I was desperate, absolutely desperate. So what on earth did you do? Well, I relented, of course, and I got the old lady a will form. Of course, I had to smuggle it past that crazy old maid of hers. She was... Poison. Undiluted poison. And it took me months to get the old lady to keep her promise and sign a damn will. A will? But she didn't have a will. Yes, she did. Let me tell this. It's my story. Go on, Mrs. Quilling. A week before she died, her maid got ill. So I thought I'd have a go again at the old lady. This time, I hit the jackpot. She had 10,000 to leave, and she put my baby down for eight for me to take care till she was 21. So I went and got the caretaker and the, the, the lady across the road to, to witness so that it was all official, and then I kept it under lock and key in our house. Well, that was a good start for your daughter, whatever misfortunes came afterwards. Whatever benefit my baby got was only from a dead father's family, and that was mean, cold charity. But what about the will? But that bloody will! It wasn't legal! I only found out after she was dead. I took it straight round to the solicitors. They saw through it right away. She'd scribbled alterations all over it. She must have done it while I was seeing the witnesses out of the house. I thought we'd come up trumps when she died. The silly, stupid old cow! Why the hell did you have to go and alter it? Right, that's it. Out. Now. And you two. I saw you egging her on. Out. Well, there's the motive and the opportunity, and perhaps a madness that comes from living with an unconfessed crime. Well, I don't think you'll have to visit Roger Romero now. Oh, I don't know. I won't do any harm. Bye. Bye. We need to talk. Get in. Drive around the corner and then get me a newspaper. I was having a chat with Henry Archer earlier on about this painter case. Confidentially, I think it'd be a good thing if you took an interest. Really, sir? Why is that? Well, when it all started, I assumed, as I'm sure you did, that there was nothing in it, but... Well, skeletons in policemen's cupboards can reflect badly on everyone. Better we'd take care of it ourselves rather than another force comes in to do it for us. Hmm? Oh, thank you, George. All right, Mike.
Sorry to keep you waiting. Been exercising a new horse. Charles Bowman. Roger Primero. So when uh, Mrs. Primero was murdered, that Krilling woman still thought that the will was valid? Yes. Now, surely you have to consider her a prime suspect. Well, we can't do anything. You realize that, sir. I want you to tell me if I have sufficient grounds to write to the Home Secretary. You don't even have any circumstantial evidence. I would advise against it. I think I shall write just the same. Well, you must do as you please, sir. Have you heard about Alice Flower? No. Passed away yesterday. A happy release, I dare say. Mrs. Primero's grandson was with her at the end. Yes. I believe he's been very kind to her. I hope you find the rest of your stay at sir. Have you, um, had a chance to see any of the country around here, sir? Uh, yes, I went to Forby yesterday. I was in the churchyard. I happened to notice the, the grave of the boy the chief inspector mentioned the other day. Ah, John Grace, the poet. Yes, they're very proud of him in Forby. His picture was all over the town. He also wrote plays, it seems. Some people even regard him as a sort of religious mystic. My son knows his work. Does he know? I'm surprised that John Grace's fame has spread beyond the parish boundary, let alone to Oxford. Is your son helping you with your investigation, sir? Yes. He came down yesterday. He's rather desperate, I'm afraid. It's Tess's birthday soon. But... I see. He hopes to give her an innocent father as a present. Of course, the murder was all my fault, really. If only I hadn't left my grandmother so early that Sunday evening. I had to meet a couple of chaps in a pub over at Sewingbury. The thing was, they were waiting in another pub. I hung around for about an hour. Then I went home. How many times I've relived that evening. And that was when you were a solicitor's clerk, around about the time you started your first business? Yes, it's terrible, but the thing is, it was the making of me. I needed 10,000 at the time. And suddenly I had it. Speak of us, Mrs. Krilling. Now it's Roger Primero. We're not professional detectives, Charles. I think we should go a little carefully, that's all. Alice Flower died. Oh, I know all about that. Primero was full of it. He's the one arranging the funeral. The kind man taking care of everything. Made it very easy to talk about the murder, actually. I didn't think you'd be so callous, Charles. Well, I think he's a crook. Anyone with that much money and power. What's so sad is the way he obviously needs to flaunt it. The house, the horses, the butler. Oh, and I had the expensive-looking wife paraded in front of me as well. You know, I'm not so sure we're doing the right thing here. I mean, they all close ranks when something like this happens. It's instinctive. I do realise this could put you in a very difficult position. But with your boss being so hostile, we don't see who else we can turn to. You do see the point, don't you? Both Alice Flower and Mrs. Krilling said that Mrs. Primero had just 10,000 to leave. But apparently Roger Primero didn't get only a third of that. He got the whole 10,000, the exact amount he needed to set himself up in business. There we are. Please help yourselves to sugar and milk. Thanks. Now, there wasn't a will. We've already checked that. So the 10,000 should have been split three ways between him and his sisters. That's, what, 3,000 odd each. But Primero got the lot. We wondered if you could help us track down the sisters. There's not an awful lot to go on. One of them could still be unmarried and living in London. Yes, as you say, not a lot to go on. Well, you see, his alibi is just so weak. He was in a pub waiting for some mates, but they never turned up. I mean, that's pathetic. Instead of leaving his grandmother's house, like he said, he could have easily hidden himself or, or, or sneaked back to the job. you're letting your imagination run away with you. Dad, I can't lose Tess. I can't. You've no idea what I'm going through. All right, um, leave it with me. I'll see what I can do.
keep turning it over and over and over. There's bound to be a reasonable explanation why Primera ended up with all the money. It's just whether to look into it without telling Reg. Well, I suppose you could argue that you knew he was fed up with it all. You, you just didn't want to bother him anymore. Could. If you were Reg Wexford, would you believe me? No. Me neither. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty of capital murder. Is that the verdict of you all? It is. Herbert Arthur Painter, you have been found guilty of murder. A murder most foul, callous and brutal. There is no place for your kind in a decent, lawful society. You shall be taken from here to a place of execution and you shall be hanged by the neck no. until you are dead. No, as God's my witness. May the Lord have mercy I'm on innocent. you. I'm innocent. I didn't do it. Oh, man. I'm innocent, I tell you, I didn't do it. I didn't do it! I'm innocent, I tell you! I didn't bloody do it! You can't kill me, I didn't do it! I'm innocent, I tell you! You bastard! Reg? How would you like to go to the Isle of Wight for a couple of days? <laughs> that would be lovely. Go tomorrow. Do break for us. Get away from it all. Wonderful. Inspector Burton, we spoke on the phone. Ah, uh, yes. How did you find me? Uh, in the phone book. There are many Primeros, even in London. And luckily you hadn't married. Lucky for you, lucky for me. My sister's married. She's in there, escaping from husband and kids. She only lives across the way. Do have a seat. Thank you. So, what do you want me to tell you? All of this happened when I was about seven years old, you know. Yes, uh, I understand that. Just, um, whatever comes to mind, really. Well, I remember old Granny Rose lived in a big old rented house. I think the family had lost most of their money some years earlier. We went for tea a few times. It was a dark, horrible place. I remember being afraid to go to the bathroom on my own. The maid used to have to take me. I never saw Painter, if that's what you're after. Well, there was a child we used to play with. Elizabeth, her name was, and Painter had a daughter, but Grandmother said she was common. We weren't to have anything to do with her. 
I'd quite like to have nothing to do with the people around me now. My sister Isabel. Oh, the policeman. Have a seat. Why all this fuss about something that happened 30 years ago? We're just trying to make absolutely sure that justice was properly done. Yeah? Well, it certainly wasn't done to us. I'm sorry? Nothing. Doesn't matter. I haven't spoken to your brother Roger yet. Neither have we for the last 25 years. You had a falling out? Our grandmother left £10,000. It should have been split three ways. It wasn't. Roger got it all. You see, in law, he was perfectly entitled to it. Mind you, it would have been a different story if our grandmother had died a month later. I don't quite follow you. If you saw our brother, you would. Do you see any resemblance between Roger and us? No, not at all. We're not alike either, are we? That's because we're not sisters. Roger isn't our brother. Roger is our mother's son, and Mrs. Primero is his grandmother, his father's mother. Our mother couldn't have any more children. She waited 11 years after she had Roger, then she adopted me. A year later, she adopted Isabel as well. But, um, you were legally adopted. Mm. Didn't make any difference. Granny Primero didn't make a will. You see, before 1959, adopted children couldn't inherit unless the dead person had made a will. A month after dear old Granny died, the law changed. Just our rotten luck. If she'd have lasted another four weeks, everything would have been different. <sighs> Our mother was at him for years to give mm. her something. He made vague promises. Oh, yes, but smart, sharp, greedy Roger kept the lot. Would you like some coffee, Inspector? Uh, yes, thank you. about some grisly murder. <laughs> Nothing like a surprise to keep a marriage fresh. convinced he's weeded out the real murderer. I've never met the man, but from what I've heard, it doesn't seem very likely. Do I? No, no, I'm fine, really. Yes, dear, I know. Well, it'll just be a few more days. So, tell me some gossip about the parish. Cheer me up. He was working in a solicitor's office at the time, so he could have known that the law was about to change and he wouldn't get the whole 10,000. He needed the money desperately, and his alibi is very weak. I mean, meeting some mates in a pub, but they didn't turn up. Well, surely he was investigated at the time. So he wasn't called to the trial. In fact, there's no evidence that Reg ever suspected him. And the will business never came up? Well, I mean, Roger Primero, the solicitor, looked respectable, and uh, Painter, the odd job man, didn't. Oh, God. Anything but this. Mike. 
No one is infallible, including Reg Wexford. Don't look, Lizzie. Oh, I've just cut myself. Well, go on. Run, run, run to Granny Rose. kind of you. You'd have been waiting at that bus stop some time. The service was cut last year. According to the estate agent, it's the next turning on the left. Are you sure this is the house you want to see? I'm positive. I can't believe you're interested in buying this place. Well, it's more curiosity, really. I see. Well, it only needs an imaginative owner give it a new lease of life. Do you know, I have heard about this place so often, I always wanted to see it inside. This is the kitchen. This is where the maid, you know, poor Alice, was cooking lunch. You know about the murder then? Oh, absolutely, off by heart. And if that's there, where is the room where it all happens? This must be it.
This is where the murder took place. Are you an armchair detective? <laughs> Just curious. <clears throat> You're very like your son. Or oh, he's like you. It's the jaw. Or the eyes. And, of course, the blazer. I didn't know you'd met my son. Bowman? What is that, his, his writing pseudonym? You didn't tell me you worked for a newspaper. Where did you meet him? He came to interview my husband. He was doing a piece for the Times. Your husband is Roger Primero. Yes. What's the matter? But I thought your name was Ide. Ide? Primero? What's in a name? The relative whose grave you put the flowers on. That was Mrs. Primero. Your husband's grandmother. That's how you know about the murder. I've been such a fool. Forgive me. What? I is my maiden name. I I kept it for modeling. I've fallen in love with you. the first one I used in anger. This was the, uh, the first one to go into the collection. Still, you didn't come over here to play with guns, did you? Now, this is the problem of keeping one's whole history. And uh, 50 years is a long time. Right, I, um, I copied everything out when the Defence Ministry told me you might be... Oh, yes. Told me you might be coming over here. Here we are. Uh, name, Herbert Arthur Painter, rank, private number 1101730. Yes, right, those are the notes that I got ready at the, uh, at the time of the trial. I thought I might be, uh, I thought I might be called as a character witness, as I'd been his commanding officer at the time. I mean, that was the usual drill. It always bothered me why the defence didn't call you. Oh, well, you read that, you'll soon find out. Oh, now, come on, Dora. Oh, no work. <laughs> Just the two of us playing hooky. A spontaneous weekend away. One it was. It still is. I just popped in to collect some papers. We want too bad a lunch. Wasn't it? I think I've ever eaten bully beef before. And it was the way his wife flinched every time he shouted, bang. <laughs> <laughs> I think I loved you from the first time I saw you. I think I, that's how it was. How? What was? I'm married, you know that. I have a son. What you don't know is I'm a clergyman. A priest. Why didn't you tell me? I've got no right to love you. Who you are. What I am. Why didn't you tell me? You were a priest. I'm sorry. Please, I think you should go now. Please, go now.
Are you sure you got it right? Yes, yes. Inspector Burden confirmed it yesterday. Roger Primera had a definite strong motive. He also had an open opportunity and a pathetic alibi. It must be enough to reopen the case. Oh. What an amazing birthday present. Yeah. Excuse me. Please. Sorry. Was it worth a visit? Well, you remember me telling you that Archer's investigation made everybody involved look back at the past, whether they liked it or not. Well, there's been something niggling at me for the last 30 years. It wasn't so much Painter. It was his defence counsel. He struck me as useless. Always doodling on his pad. What? I've always remembered it, and I've always wondered why he didn't call Painter's ex-commanding officer. Was it incompetence, or did he know that... Uh, Painter's army background wouldn't do him any favours. And? Well, there was a list of minor charges, drunk and disorderly, that sort of thing. And then there was a manslaughter charge of a young woman in a village when he was out in the Far East. Well, he was uh, found not guilty, but it doesn't make pretty reading. Oh, the man was an animal. He killed the old woman. No doubt about it, in my mind. Never has been. There's just one thing that strikes me, though. That's his demob date. Just doesn't add up. I'll get the colonel to check that. There you are. Morning. So where did you get to last night? I couldn't find you anywhere. Did you check out the house? Yes. And? Well, if he wanted to, there are places Roger Pomero could have hidden instead of going out the front door. Well, that's great. So, why are you looking so glum? Am I? Sorry. I didn't know I was. Look, I've found out that this Wexford character doesn't get back until this afternoon, so I've arranged a meeting for two o'clock. In the meantime, Tess and I thought we'd go for a drive in the country. Why don't you join us? No, no, I don't think so. You've been working so hard on this. You must have some fun. Oh, come on. Well, very thorough, Mike. Very thorough indeed. You're the first person to see it. Before he goes to Deputy Chief Constable Freeborn. Reg, I hated writing every single word of it. Oh, it's interesting. And new to me. I didn't know the Primero sisters were adopted. Convenient for Roger Primero, wasn't it? Of course, it's assuming that Primero knew about the impending change in the law. But then he was working in a solicitor's office at the time. Yes. Yes, he was. I'm in no way concluding the painter was innocent. But it did cross your mind. I just think that this new information concerning Primero is significant. Didn't you suspect him at all? No. No, I didn't. Sorry to disturb you, Gov, but Mr. Primero's here to see you. Oh, uh, yes, I said I'd see him. Show him straight in. We'll talk about this later, Mike. Mr. Primero. Good morning. Detective Inspector Burden. Hello. Uh, thank you, Inspector. Uh, later, then. I'm in court till this afternoon. Take a seat. What can I do for you, Mr. Primero? Catch a con man. Nasty little jerk posing as a journalist. What? No, no, not at all. This joker rang me up. Said he was from the Times. Wanted to do an article about my early life. Well, I gave him a hell of a long interview. And even had lunch with me and my wife. And then you thought about it, rang up the Times and found it didn't exist. How did you know? It happens. I'm surprised at you, sir. A man of your experience. The time that you should have rung the newspaper was when you first made contact. I feel so stupid. Uh, no money changed, has it? No, 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 no. I don't feel that stupid. It's what I don't understand. What was he after? Well, a con man will often go after a man like you, sir. Rich, successful, and in the public eye. Because he knows, and you mustn't take this personally, sir, uh, that most people, even law-abiding citizens, have something in their past lives that they don't want to have known. Perhaps he was um, trying to find something to blackmail you with. 
Oh, perhaps you were just crazy. Hmm. Seemed nice enough. Good looking, well educated. In fact, my wife was quite taken with him. I haven't mentioned this to her yet. It might upset her. Called himself Bowman. Charles Bowman. Charles? Funny thing was, he seemed particularly interested in my grandmother. Was he? Yes, well, I, uh, I wouldn't trouble yourself with this anymore, sir, if I was you. Well, you think he's a nut? Well, he's harmless, anyway. But I'll see that he doesn't trouble you again. He will. Thank you for your time. Oh, uh, off to a funeral. Poor old Alice. Oh, yes. What are you doing? Are you lurking about? Well, there's a funeral just finishing. We've been looking all over the village for you. Come along. Uh, no, Charles, uh, wait a minute. What for? Oh, come on. Tess is waiting in the car. today, Mr. Bowman. Roger. You recognise him, darling? I'll need you as a witness. What? Witness? Roger, do you remember Mr. Archery, who we met at the dance? This is his son. Do you deny that you made your way into my home under false pretenses? He's a journalist. He uses a pseudonym, that's all. They're here on holiday. I'm afraid that's not quite true, Mrs. Premier. My father and I came down here with the express purpose of collecting certain information. And in order to do that, we had to work our way into your confidence. OK, maybe we've been a bit unscrupulous, but we thought the end justified the means. I'm afraid I don't understand. What the hell is that all about? What information? Don't tell me here. You come down with me right now. We'll lay out your information in front of Chief Inspector Wexford. You should already have it. And at our meeting with him at two o'clock this afternoon, we'll find out exactly what he intends to do about it. Come along, Charles. Inspector Wexford now knows just how convenient it was for you that your grandmother died when she did. And how you used the law to cheat your sisters out of their inheritance. And how on that evening 30 years ago you concealed yourself in your grandmother's house and murdered her. You're out of your mind. That's enough, Charles. This is ridiculous. This is plain ridiculous. It's horrible. Let's go home, darling. Mr. Archery, I hope you've had more pleasure from this trip than you've given us. Guilty, guilty, guilty. I suppose by pleasure she means the free lunch they gave me, the cheapskate. Did you notice how she couldn't even look at me? Oh, come on, Dad, it's so English to have a phobia about scenes. I'm sorry, I'll tell you about it in the car. Well, I've read Inspector Bergen's report, and I've had time to reflect on it. But before we go any further, I must tell you that I've had a complaint about you from Mr. Primero. Oh, really, that... Yes, that. Now, I've known for a few days that your father has made the acquaintance of the Primeros. And I told your father that if he was going to call on any of the people concerned in the case, he was to be careful not to make trouble. Now, your little escapade with Mr. Primero is what I call making trouble. And I won't have it. Well, I'm sorry. 
But you're not going to tell me that your people don't occasionally invent a cover story to get what they want. My people have the law on their side. They are the law. Now that we've got the lecture out of the way, we can turn to what you've uncovered. However... I know what you're going to say, that Primero had an alibi, and I realise that your people would have checked it out, and after all this time, it's going to be very difficult to come up with concrete evidence. His alibi was not checked. What? Roger Primero's alibi was not checked. Why the hell not? Charles. Now, I'm happy to discuss the whole thing with you and answer any questions that you like, but not in the presence of Miss Kershaw. You can't treat a grown woman like a child. We are going to be married. I'm sorry that this has been such a fruitless meeting. We won't have any secrets. Inspector Burden will see you out. I understand. I'll go. Tess. Can't you see? He can't talk about my father in front of me. So, what about this alibi that for some mysterious reason was never investigated? There's no mystery about it. Mrs. Primero was killed between 6.25 and 7 o'clock. Yes, yes. She was killed in Kings Markham. At 6.30, Roger Primero was seen in Sawingbury, ten miles away. Oh, he was seen, was he? Well, doesn't it seem remotely possible that he could have fixed it beforehand that he'd be seen? There's always some shifty mate who'll perjure himself for the right price. All right, he was seen. OK. Who saw him? I saw him. You? I, with my little eye. You might have told us this before. I would have done if I had the remotest idea that you suspected him. To chat up Mr. Primero about his grandmother is one thing. To pin a murder on him is another. You're quite sure? Even after 30 years? Absolutely. I knew Roger Primero's face very well. I'd often seen him in court at his role as solicitor's clerk. On that particular evening, I'd arranged to meet an informant in the pub. As I was leaving at 6.30, I ran slap bang into Roger Primero. I even remember that he asked whether he could buy me a short snort. Very much his language. There's no way he could have been near the house at the time of the murder. I'm sorry. But the fact is that old Mrs. Rose Primero was murdered by Herbert Painter. I won't keep you a moment, miss. Take a seat. Oh, come on. I don't want to sign in. I'll be a few moments. Thank you. They're complete bastards, aren't they? Mr. Archery, if you put this behind you, I'm sure that you'll find happiness together. I'm sorry. The painter daughter is sitting next to the Krilling daughter out there. Quite an irony, isn't it? Oh, come on, Mike. Let's bury it. If I'd known that you were investigating Premier, I would have put you right. You could have put me right first thing this morning. Oh, we were interrupted. And you were... On your way to court. Oh, come on! I had to be taught a lesson, didn't I? The same lesson as Charles Archery. It was so obvious. You were really enjoying your cat and mouse game with him, weren't you? Oh, that's ridiculous. Is it? Well, perhaps I was a bit hard on him. But it's forgivable when you think what I'd been put through. And for you to think that I'd sent an innocent man to the gallows, well, that must have shaken a few deeply held convictions, eh? That's no bad thing, is it? If I don't mind, and my parents don't mind, then why can't we just get married and forget you ever had a fun? Who says they don't mind? Look, considering everything, I've been very lucky. I've had my mum. And a wonderful stepfather. Who loved me. And he encouraged me to get where I am today. Yeah. But maybe this is one bit I have to dip out on. What does that mean? It was ridiculous to imagine we could get married. Oh. Oh, I know you try to understand. You've no idea. You've no idea. 
of the stigma and the pain that I carried around. And it's not just the cruelty of other people. It's what I've done to myself. I just can't find any peace while I have to live with this injustice. I want you to answer me, truthfully. Do you still believe my father is innocent? Well, we never really investigated the Krilling woman. She was terrified that her daughter might give away some terrible family secret, but I mean, who knows what she might be capable of. It would gnaw away at us, Charles. I know, in my heart, that my father is innocent. to apologize for this morning. It was unforgivable. <laughs> I've forgiven you for this morning. It was really nothing to do with you, was it? It's... It's just the other times that seem... incomprehensible. I was hoping that I could say all this on the phone, but I can't. I want to see you. All my life. All my life. I... I know. I know. Well, it would be impossible to meet here. And the hotel isn't a good idea, so... What about the old house? Eight o'clock, all right? Well, I thought you would have been pleased that Reg was right all along. Of course I'm pleased. I'm sorry. I'm just angry with myself for being drawn into that damn vicar's web. You did do the right thing, you know, Mike. Yes, well, if I'd waited 48 hours and asked Reg, I wouldn't have had to. Yes. And how did you feel for that 48 hours? Knowing that an innocent man had been hanged. The same argument that Reg used. Well, it doesn't work because Peter wasn't innocent, he was guilty. And I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I can't drum up much compassion towards cold-blooded men. Hello? Hello? nothing. It was the law at the time the money came to me. It was perfectly legal. Perhaps it would make you feel better if you gave them their third share now. I would arrange it. You wouldn't have to meet them. Hmm. Oh, yeah, 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 why not? Not the point, though, is it? How the hell am I supposed to remember my exact movements of 30 years ago? Wexford's going to be suspicious. Bound to be. My whole standing in this community is, is shot to pieces because of that damn priest and his son. What does it do to us? You know I've always cared for you. Very much. 
But you've never really loved me, have you? I know you didn't do it. Sorry. Going on like this. You're on your way out. No. It's too wet. Anyway, I think it's too late now. back here again, you little stuck-up snob. And you know what I'll do? Wherever I am, wherever, I'll find you. And I'll give you what I gave the old girl. So, even after he threatened you, you still came back here later with your mother? I was much more frightened of letting her know I'd been out of my party frock than I was of him. I can remember her shouting at me to run into the room. And then I saw her. What do you think it was like for me? I was five years old. What happened then? They put me to bed. I was ill for weeks. I didn't know they'd arrested Painter. Perhaps they didn't think I'd understand. All I knew was he'd made Granny Rose burst open and if I said I'd seen him, he'd do the same to me. But even after they arrested him, you still didn't tell anyone then? I'm too frightened. He'd find me, you see, wherever he was. And she wouldn't listen to me, ever. Don't think about it. You put it out of your mind. But it wouldn't go out. It's never gone out. The nightmare's always there. Why did you come back here tonight? I had a row with her. I knew this place was empty. Made myself a bed upstairs. So the coat was yours? Of course it was. I heard you calling out some woman's name, so I went out. Thought you'd gone, so I came back. Anyway, whose did you think it was? Bert Painter's. Always raking up the past, aren't you? And always snooping. You really put the wind up my mother. Yes. She was terrified some awful secret would come out. <laughs> you want to know what the big secret is, Vicar? Well, you're looking at it, Vicar. The big secret revealed. All those little dots. Needle marks. She gets dihydrocodine to ease her back pain, only she gives the stuff to me. It's easy. You dissolve it in water, fill up a hypodermic, have a drink, and you're off. She does it to keep her baby happy. To keep her baby 
home and under control, more like. Shouldn't we have just notified the police? She might harm herself or something. We'll take her mother to her and they can sort it out themselves. I don't want to see another policeman for a very long time. Mrs. Quilling! Round the back, Dad. You can't break in. I haven't broken anything. Find the light switch, Charles. Brandy. Couldn't you smell it? But why? Why did it happen? The father knows the answer. The 30-year-old nightmare I brought back to life. I remember Elizabeth Quilling. Little girl. The pink, frilly dress. She'll never wear again because it was all spotted with blood. Where is she, Mr. Archery? Too late to protect her nerve. She might be in danger. She's uh, at the old house. What will they do to her? The law will take care of her. It's all right. I didn't feel like taking anything. I think I might have killed my mother. But will you give a murderer a hug? Excuse me, sir. I've just taken a call from a Colonel Plashett. Said he checked the painter's demob date and the facts that he gave you, sir, are definitely correct. I don't know. Is it important, sir? Rewrites history, Sergeant. I'm sorry, sir, but as you found the body, you'll have to come back for the inquest and the magistrate's court hearing. Elizabeth Crilling found a body 30 years ago. If it hadn't been for her mother's greed, that wouldn't have happened. She told me... Her mother would never allow her to talk about Painter. Perhaps she killed her because she could never release that horror into the light of day. Perhaps. Or perhaps she finally refused to give her daughter the tablets that she wanted and she lashed out in an addict's frenzy. You and I are never going to agree about anything, are we, Chief Inspector? Oh, I don't know, sir. What's this? It's maths. 
a little poetry and a photograph. You could look upon it as a birthday present for your future daughter-in-law. So you see, we're both right, sir. You by faith, and I by reason. What if it's too late? Forgive the intrusion, Mrs. Kershaw, but I'd very much like to have a talk with you. And I'd like to see Tess. You've quarreled, haven't you? You've broken the poor girl's heart. I have to see her. She isn't here. She's gone for a walk in the woods. I don't know how long she'll be. I'll find her. You better come in. You can look at the garden whilst I make some tea. So pretty this time of year. No, Mrs. Cashel. Please sit down. How was your stay at King's Markham? Your native village is Forby, isn't it? I went to visit a grave while I was there. Oh, yes. Mrs. Primero is buried there, isn't she? It wasn't her grave I saw. Go, shepherd, to your rest. Your tale is told. The Lamb of God takes shepherds to his fold. You kept all of his poems, didn't you? May I see them? Will you show me the works of John Grace? I'd have shown them to you before if you'd have asked. Here, have them. You can have them. Only don't ask me about him. I have no right to be your inquisitor. I'll tell you anything you want to know about Painter. Anything. I don't want to hear about Painter anymore. I'm not interested in him. I want to know about Tess's father. And I now know that Herbert Painter couldn't have been her father. just a friend. My Tessie, does she have to know after all these years? But it's nothing these days. Nobody thinks anything of it anymore. But nobody knew. When I remarried, I couldn't even tell Mr. Kershaw. He was taking on so much as it was. How much do you know? You and John Grace, you live close to each other in Forby. You were in love with each other, but he was killed in a road accident. You were so clever. They never understood the things that he wrote. They were so beautiful. After he was killed, you discovered you were going to have his child. <laughs> we never did anything wrong but the ones. I've never been one for that side of things. We were engaged. We were going to be married. I imagine you met Painter before he went out east. Perhaps he was 
stationed in Forby before he was posted. John Grace died in February 1954. In March of that year, Painter returned from the army. You were facing an enormous social stigma. You had nowhere to go, you were frightened. And so you married Painter. Please, let me try to finish. You married Painter and allowed him to think that he was Tess's father. He always suspected he wasn't, and so he treated you both very cruelly. But when you married Mr. Kershaw, you never told him any of this. He never asked me about my life with Bert. I was far too ashamed to tell him. How could I? He was marrying the widow of a murderer. A man that had been hanged. How could I tell him what was even worse? Tess was illegitimate. You've done nothing to reproach yourself for. You just did what I should have done years ago. I didn't want to rock the boat. I was too tactful, too damn diplomatic. And after a while, you live with the inconsistencies as though they're the truth. Yes. Yes, I know. 